Hello, I'm Roger Sutton. I'm Chief Executive of CERA. It's been 18 months since, I, since the ground first shook in Canterbury. And over these last 18 months, we've been really busy, looking after our houses, looking after our land, working in new jobs. And in the middle of all this, I think it's very, very easy to forget about our health. So with me today is a panel of experts, a panel of experts who know about health, who know about how to help us get through these times. And with me today, joining us is... David Mates, who's Chief Executive of the Canterbury District Health Board. Raymond Pink, who's the uh, Medical Officer of Health. Jeremy Baker, who's a General Practitioner, working um, especially around the area of mental health. And Caroline Bell, who's a specialist who works in um, anxiety issues. So, starting with you, David, um, the hospital, of course, was very much centre stage in those, in those days and those, in those weeks following. Um, the big quakes. How are things going there at the hospital at the moment? What, what, should, what should we know about how your operations are? Well, firstly, it's been pretty remarkable how the whole Canterbury Health Systems, you know, kind of responded to, uh, you know, kind of to the earthquake. And uh, in many respects, it's quite amazing that we actually haven't imploded. And part of that is actually Canterbury has been working as a single system for quite a period of time. And when we've lost 106 hospital beds, 630 odd age residential care beds, a number of community pharmacies, a number of general practices that have um, not been able to operate, it's really you know, been remarkable that despite all of that, actually health services, we're doing more than what we were doing before the earthquake. And you know, we've got um, just over 9,000 hospital rooms that are damaged, some of the really simple um, repairs that we're doing. The main Parkside Hospital, uh, every staircase is needing to be cut out of there. Um, and that in itself is about a 52 week um, piece of work. And that's the really, really simple stuff. And we're out of about 17 um, buildings at the moment. And again, ongoing issues are, are meaning that we're going to be having a number of facilities that we will struggle to continue to provide services from. We've still got about 700 people that are working in different places than what they were on the 22nd of February. Um, and despite that, we're still providing more services, but it is very, very much on a knife edge. And it's a knife edge both in terms of the community, in terms of the hospitals, and in terms of actually how we're going to continue to meet the challenges over this next 12 or 18 months, the next two or three years. So to tell us about that next, you know, the, those next two, two or three years, what sort of changes can we expect to see? Well, just to give an example, this year we're going to be managing about 20,000 people in a community setting that uh, if you were anywhere else in the country, you would probably be hospitalised. And part of that is, you know, has been possible with organised general practice, organised community services, and the interactions between the hospital and the, uh, the community uh, setting. We've got a lot more services that have been set up to support people to stay in their own homes and uh, to, you know, kind of to stay well and to recover quicker from there. But right at this particular point, we have no further capacity to um, get anything wrong in the Canterbury Health System. We get any part of that out of balance. And everything starts falling over Everything quickly. starts grinding to a standstill very quickly. Ramon, tell us, about, tell us about the public. I mean, a lot of people are living in um, houses affected by liquefaction. Um, they're living in places that just you know, aren't as warm as they were before. Tell us about some of those sort of health challenges we've, we've, we've got out there. Mm. Well, I think one of the biggest threats that we've faced since the um, since earthquakes began has been the threat of infection. And so, for instance, with liquefaction, you um, with the uh, upwelling of the groundwater and the silt, it's you, you have to assume that that's been contaminated by sewage from broken pipes, sewer pipes. And so the encouragement for people to wear protective clothing to prevent themselves from becoming infected and the bugs that you find in liquefaction are mainly those that are going to cause vomiting and diarrhoea. Those are the messages that we've been having to, to re-emphasise. Um, dust or the, the, the liquefaction uh, dust is another issue. Uh, people are, uh, the, the dust has small particles in it. You um, for, for some, the, the, the irritation to eyes and nose and throat, for some, exacerbation of their chronic illnesses like asthma or chronic respiratory illness, uh, that has been, you know, a concern. So, so is that liquefaction, is it, it is dangerous, it is infectious? I mean, is it, is it worse when it's wet, you know, it's just coming out of the ground, or is it when it's blowing around with dust? Tell us, just explain that. 
Absolutely, good points. Because when it's wet, that's I think where your your threat of um, gastroenteritic illness is likely to be. And we did surveillance, and we were very fortunate that we didn't have that. When it's dry, the inhalation of um, of the dust particles it's not um, going to make it's not going to give you a, a horrible tummy bug. No, it's not going to give you that's not going to give you give you a horrible tummy bug. No, but it can irritate previous illnesses that you have. We don't believe we've done respiratory surveillance since the earthquakes have happened and we haven't seen any significant rise in respiratory illness, including um, pneumonia, uh, since over the last 15 to 18 months. But one of the things that we are encouraging people to do is go back to your GP if those uh, are issues uh, for you. The other thing is mould. You know, if you get liquefaction under yep. your home particularly, um, you get that damp coming up, the proliferation of mould, um, uh, and the likely release of spores which can cause allergy for some people, or obviously the, living in a cold home uh, when we're facing winter. Those are other concerns and we're encouraging people, you know, talk to the the environmental team at the City Council to give you advice around these things. So these threats of infection are very real uh, for people and so those basic things of, of hygiene and taking yep. advice where you need it. Is so important. silt still in the garden yep. from liquefaction, is mm -hmm. that actually of any danger to me? Can I leave the kids to play in it? I wouldn't let your kids play in the silt. Because I, it may have been affected by, by some sewage at some stage. Absolutely. What we do know, and we've analysed this stuff, we do know that the bugs that uh, were in it when it came up are still likely to be um, to be in it. When it dries and it becomes dusty, you're not going to get the bugs in it, yep. uh, but you can get those other respiratory things. So if you've still got liquefaction in your yard, move it away, keep your kids away. Do it away, away and don't let your kids Absolutely. It. Yep. Jeremy, so tell us about the physical, you know, tell, tell us about what, what sort of issues, what kind of extra issues are being presented at GPs at the moment with all this stuff that's going on out there? Well, I think as Ramon said, the, the, the levels of um, respiratory disease didn't come to light and you talk to the specialist and they say, great, perhaps the particle was too large to cause deep-seated lung problems. But you've got other issues. Um, heart problems have been a significant yep. issue, uh, increased in ischemic events, heart, chest yep. pains. Yep. You've had, uh, fortunately, not too much of a rise in the, the, the tummy bugs, which is great. Mm. But there's uh, these little glands we have in our bodies called the adrenal glands, which I think everybody knows about, and they've been ticking away at, at a rate about two to three times above what they're expected to do, uh, for longer than they're ever expected to do. And so you have this overriding physical effect that just lodges in your muscles, it lodges in your chest, you feel distressed, but you haven't actually got a heart problem, you've just, you've just got muscle tension, and that's causing sleep problems, that's causing loss of your routines, your lifestyles, you're becoming exhausted. So the GPs are always trying to case manage these new types of issues, not sure exactly will we get to a problem underneath or is it mm. again a sleep problem, is it a stress problem once more? And you're working quite hard and your staff are working hard and the community's working hard to, to get a grip across the board really. So that's kind of the physical stuff and the physical stuff's obviously important but the physical stuff is something that someone we're all much more willing to talk about but the mental health stuff, you know, that stress stuff, mm. you know, there must be a lot more stuff coming up at GPs at the moment, Jeremy. And I think if you looked at every physical problem, there's a psychological problem that's walked through the door as well. And the anxieties, the stresses, preying on that resilience that we hopefully have had as Kiwis, but gently undermining it, and a few more events, a few large socks and shocks, and suddenly... Those, that it. extra stuff that you've been bearing is coming to the surface and uh, at the end of the day you're seeing kids not sleeping, you're mm. seeing separation anxiety. But the overall sense, well I can't see it ending so how much hope have I got yeah. for the future? Can I see a future? Mm. Caroline, you work in the sort of anxiety area and you know, I think everyone's sort of anxious as a result of all these quakes. Yeah. You know, a big truck goes past, we think gee there's something else about to hit us. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about how you, how you help with, how, how you work with people in communities to manage that anxiety and all those sort of issues. Okay, so what we're seeing is, is just like you say, a huge spectrum of response where I think pretty much everyone um, is feeling on edge, tense, not sleeping well, can't concentrate, can't make decisions, very jumpy when trucks go by, 
all those kind of things. And they've been going on and on and on. And I think what we're seeing more now is actual fatigue and exhaustion with running with those really high levels all the time. And that's probably the biggest um, thing that I think we're seeing across the community. We are also seeing people with very severe problems who are very terrified really of going into buildings or having memories about what they experienced. So that's at the one extreme and then there's everything in between and then people who say they're feeling absolutely nothing and they're completely fine and they may well be. And I think the other thing is we move along that spectrum. Some days we're okay, some days we're not okay, some days we don't sleep, some days we do sleep. And so we're all going through that. Um, and I think that's a really big thing to, to emphasise is that we are all going through this. You know, these are very abnormal events. And we hear lots of talk about the new normal, which I think tends to downplay how abnormal all these experiences that we've had and what we're feeling are. You know, I used to sleep fine and now I don't. You know, I used to be able to concentrate things and now I can't. And I think we're all experiencing that kind of thing. Um, so it's trying to manage a way through that. Um, looking after ourselves and I think that is really important so that's something that we haven't done like this before we really really need to prioritize that um, so it's not just telling you to do something it's actually prioritizing that that you do go for a walk you do go for a bike ride you do have a bath things like that and really taking time for yourself is really really important to try and help us sleep better um, not drinking too much alcohol and then living on coffee the next day. Mm. Um, I, always, I always have the three rules, exercise, sleep and now al no alcohol. Are, yeah. they, are they rules that really apply to everybody or am I, am I too much for, you know, too pure? <laughs> well, I think that would be <laughs> ideal. Well, but, you know, seriously, I, mean, yeah. I, think, I think all those, you know, extra stimulants and then you need to... Yeah. How does that, yeah? Yeah, I think, I think it's, there are right um, things to work on. I'm not sure that everyone could stick rigidly to that. Um, that might be some issues, Roger, but, you know, <laughs> I, but I think it's working within that. They are very good guidelines, you know, and it sounds so simple, but actually it's really, really important things to do. Yep. And I think recognising as well, being tolerant to other people. We're all in this. We're all feeling stressed. We're all exhausted. So we're all going to get irritable and angry with someone or something when it doesn't go right. And taking one step at a time, yep. you know, we're not going to solve the house. We're not going to solve the insurance issue in one phone call. Um, it takes a time and trying to set yourself goals that are mm. achievable is really helpful. Any other strategies for people who are anxious and finding life really hard? The real, challenge, the real challenge has been the commu community systems as well, the support systems. Yep. Those that have had relationships, been able to stay close yep. to their families, they're always going to be good protectors mm. against anxiety, depression. Um, the sense of hope or not, the sense of having a something to look forward to outside the city or another can you keep your music going mm. can you keep your walking yep. can yep. you keep your your relationships and communications going and those are things that are going to be fed from the top as well so if we feel that the the leaders are not supporting us or giving us that mm. message we're going to struggle to hold yep. it together for ourselves uh, so I think that you know you, you've got challenges for the types of community support but also from the expert support which one's going to Yep. be the best and given the answer when you just are losing your hope. David, do you, what do you see from the health? Are you seeing these sort of trends in the health system? Yeah, the, Heart uh, issues, anxiety? Yeah, yeah um, certainly the yeah, kind of cardiac one has been you know, an immediate aftermath of the uh, September earthquakes and uh, that probably did a favour for a number of people that were thinking about having a cardiac event because it seemed to bring on mm. uh, an awful lot. But I think generally things are just taking longer to do. You yeah, know, kind of when you go to see, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a doctor or a um, another health professional, things are just—it's not the simple, straightforward um, elements that are sitting there. Um, you know, people are, you know, kind of people are struggling still, I think, to make sense of things. But the sense of certainty and hope is really, really important. And one of the things we're seeing quite a lot now is people are saying, well, actually, if we can see a future in the next five to six years, we want to be part of it. Yep. Actually, beyond that. Actually, that's my professional career. You know, kind of why or what? You know, kind of why would I stay around? And I think that's becoming that's becoming much more real for a lot of people. And I think that's one of our collective challenges: is how we give that certainty, that sense of actually this is going to be the greatest Things place to live in the world. Mm. Things yeah. are going to get better. And actually, our role in in you know, kind of what that means for me as an individual to feel 
actually there is hope, there is a future, and this is a place where we really want to live. Well, have you got any comments, Ramon, from where you sit about managing our mental health and our health generally in look, these times? Yes, I, look, I really appreciate the comments of the rest of the panel, and I was thinking, after February 22, I got a job offer in Auckland, actually, same role. And um, I thought to my, I wrestled with, well, do I stay here and, and commit myself to this rebuild? Tough it or, out. Yeah, tough it out or no. And I, I, I had to really, I swung on that one, I have to say. But the thing is, there are also unique opportunities here as well. And that changed my, changed my thinking. But just referring back to what David said, there are, there is that challenge for us as professionals and at, at a whole variety of different levels of people saying, well, should I stay, should I, should I go? My, my family have left, actually. They've gone to Australia. And you kind of feel a bit disjointed from them. And I'm sure lots of people are in that similar situation. So encouraging one another, giving that concrete kind of hope. And I, I guess, um, you know, we, we're going into winter. Winter is flu season. What are the concrete things cold that we houses. can do? Yeah, cold houses. What are the concrete things we can do? You know, flu, vaccinate yourself. You know, there are, it's, there are, there are, uh, we're providing unique opportunity in Canterbury this, this winter for those under 18 and, and over six months of age. We know that kids are, you know, little infectious bombs because they're all clustered together, share everything. And we believe if we can focus in this area, it's got benefit for the community. And that's kind of one of those concrete things that you can do. The other thing is that in, in the midst of all of these things that we've been talking about, we've, we're also in the middle of a, uh, a hoop and cough epidemic. And, you know, we've had a significant number of kiddies ending up in hospital with this. It's a deadly disease affecting those mainly under one. We've had to send some kiddies up to, um, to Auckland, That's, which is incredibly mm. distressing. Mm. In, you know, that's a family separation thing again. Yeah, mm. uh, uh, that's on top of all of the things that we've been describing. So what's a concrete, practical thing, you know? encouraging mums, caregivers, uh, dads to get your kiddies immunised at six weeks, three months, five months to protect your little ones during this during this time. So I guess it's those practical concrete things that we know that we can do, we can we can sort of tick a box that can help us in these situations. I mean is there any is there any is there any is there any concepts we want to get out there about when people do start feeling unwell, how you need to act more quickly these days? I mean I mean, I always think you never regret going, going, going and seeing your, your GP early. But I mean, a lot of GPs seem to be really, I mean, am I going to out of place, yet? really busy at the moment? Have we lost GPs in the city? Uh, we've lost some. We've lost some one or two medical centres, I think. But, and we get tired. But I'd make a plea that the, the real strength is going to be in the communities amongst those that have knowledge and, and even if you're hurting yourself. Fundamentally look, step up and look after each look other. beyond yep. your own circumstance if you can. Um, That's what those neighbourhood things are good too, aren't they? You, you just chat, you go and see someone or have a chat to someone where, you know, we were talking beforehand, you know, all around this table, yep, we're all anxious, are we sleeping well? No, we, you know, we're all feeling those kinds of things. And often hearing that people, that our colleagues, our friends, our neighbours are feeling the same things of, uh, as us, it stops us from feeling, so oh, feeling I'm relief, the only one. Oh, it's a relief. And so it's like, well, what are you doing? Oh, this is what I'm doing and this is where you should go. And yes, I am saying, you know, if you want to get your flu vaccine, get it before the flu season starts, then you're likely to be safe from it. Sorry to keep harping on that, Roger, but it's a practical thing that we but can it, do. But it is so important that talking with people, talk, yep. sharing experiences is still one of the best bits for people recovering. Yes. Yeah, and, well, and, um, and, and, and really getting to grips with a really unique set of circumstances. I think, I think just from my own observations, it's the whole sort of neighbourhood thing. You know, there was a neighbourhood party yeah. the other day and making sure we're getting out there and making those linkages with people we wouldn't normally see. Yeah. But making yeah. sure we are just talking, supporting and... and um, but it's actually great. When yeah. you go to it, it's really, really good. You feel yeah. better, you're involved in something that really matters. And it's a really great feeling. And, and that wasn't there before. So that's no. a, a newer thing that oh, is... Oh, no, I think life really is much, is much harder here, but we do yeah. have a much stronger yeah. feeling of community. Yeah. We all know our neighbours much better than yeah. we ever knew them before. Yeah. Absolutely. Very important. We have a date night, my wife and I, every week. And... Sometimes all we do is go for a drive. <laughs> it's just getting out of the house and getting time for ourselves to talk just on our own. We have four kids, teenagers, down to tots. But it's actually just making sure that you have that connection and that communication. But, uh, and you, you actually make a, you prioritise that. It's really, really important. Yeah. It's just a simple thing, but we have found it's been really, really important over these uh, 
And that, I think Perhaps. that's really important. It is really prioritising that, mm. looking after ourselves like that mm. and not just being exhausted, vegging out in front of the TV, um, really making an effort to do something and you feel so much better mm. for yeah, it. I think, I think the, like, the date nights are important. I mean, I try and have my date night as well, but also it's just sort of like a date night with a couple of the kids as well. Oh. Because at the moment, I think a lot of us are getting home and we're so tired. We yes. don't actually say, right, I'm actually going to do an hour with, 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 with George tonight or Harry or Samantha or whatever and actually making sure we do that yeah. time and you do something special yes. because we sometimes forget with our kids, a lot of them are really struggling as well. Roger, I think we should say a big thank you to all those households outside Christchurch that gave their homes for us to go to, go to, mm. to relax. They, they took us they in did. and I think that's, that was huge. And to see ourselves beyond our circumstances, again, is, is a great thing that they've done for us. And I hope they keep listening mm. uh, to our pain, our hurt, Otherwise, we might just feel isolated and, and look inward again. Oh, I think it's very e easy for the rest of the country to think, you know, the shakings yeah. slowed exactly. down again yeah. or stopped and now everything's back to normal. Well, mm. you know, if you're living in a broken house and you're not sure where that job's carrying on and you don't have grandma next door, yeah. life is still far from normal. Yeah. So yes. the rest of the country really does need to does yeah. need to appreciate that. And that's one of my jobs is trying to make sure the rest of the country really mm. gets that so they carry on giving us the support as and well. And I think it's part of it is our reality down here is not everyone else's reality. You know, people are getting on doing their own things. It's not lack of caring. Mm. It's just really hard to understand if you're not living and, you know, kind of uh, working in that type of environment. Mm. But those bits in terms of just, you know, kind of people continuing to talk and if people do have a health concern, you know, to pick up the phone and phone their general practice, mm. Even after hours, they'll get through to a, a real person, a real person. Mm -hmm. and someone that is able to give some advice yeah. and um, and uh, help them also, you know, kind of with the you know, kind of uh, some of the choices that um, you know, kind of need to be made. And GPs have a personal mobile for Roger to, to seek strength and comfort from. <laughs> <laughs> any mo any GP who wants to ring me 24 hours a day, I, I leave my phone on at all times, any time, Jeremy. I'll be happy to take any of your, you and your colleagues' calls. <laughs> David, the elderly. Tell us about how the elderly are managing and what we can do to support them. Well, they're one of our most vulnerable groups in the community. And interesting, we've got 34,000 people that are 74 years and older in Canterbury at the moment, and most of those living in Christchurch, and that, you know, kind of that's a group that's been under an enormous amount of pressure. We've seen the age residential care um, changes and some of the um, tough decisions made about shifting people to other parts of the country, knowing full well that many may not have, um, you know, may not have been able to have come back in that type of environment. But we're going to be looking at the elderly increasing up to about 56,000 in the next um, 10 years. They are staying in this community. It's almost a doubling in the size of that community. It is. And they're staying in our community, and yet many of them are in homes that are broken, and the importance of um, support, appropriate support structures in place um, for them. What else, what else is the panel saying around the elderly? I think some have done extremely well. They've been courageous. They've hung in. They've had almost more resilience than some of the younger people. Uh, perhaps it's their ex life experiences. Uh, on the other side of the ledger, some have suffered, some have uh, suffered more Alzheimer's, confusion, mm. uh, loss of hope, and that's been a tragedy. Yeah, and I think those issues complicate the anxiety. So if you are more confused or you've got physical health problems, not as a steady on your feet, the fear of the earthquakes and being able to get out or get help is really, really more frightening. So, uh, so, so for people watching this who've got an elderly neighbour or an elderly uncle or aunt, what are we doing for them? What should we be doing to look after those people at the moment? I think an important part is actually um, checking in, mm -hmm. neighbours checking in. Uh, one of the biggest concerns we've got too is actually falls in the community. Mm -hmm. um, often elderly, when they fall and they break their uh, neck of femur in particular, it's often a precursor for a general decline in health that happens uh, pretty quickly after that. And so, you know, trying to make sure that environments are as safe as possible, that uh, any obstacles and yep. um, uneven things are out of, the, um, out of the way are really, really important to um, try and minimise that impact. And keeping people involved in their community things because community is really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, going to church, going to local groups that they've done before, trying to encourage that to get going again. So that's really also helpful. maybe working with some other people to say, what other outings yeah. do you want each week? Yeah. What, what are the other things that maybe you gave up a year ago or two mm -hmm. years yeah. ago? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are those things we can help you restart and making sure you have a 
a solid routine yeah. to make sure it happens. If That's you right. don't take them, someone else takes them. Yeah. But some of them have also got lots to give. Mm. And, and they, can, they themselves can sit mm. down with families and, and just be part of a continuum of the family. Look after the kids while we do date night. Or, or. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but seriously, <laughs> but, but I think, but I think yeah. in this environment we Dance do. Gives them some you know, identity, you know and in fact, yeah. you know, date night doesn't have to be the three hours, it can be, you know, mm. 45 minutes, but the elderly feel they've actually mm. done something. Yeah, right. yeah, we, yeah, that's right. Advise what they do on the date night. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> sure, yeah. we, we, we are seeing a few, yeah, particularly um, some of the older males, that um, some have got less well-developed yeah, kind of um, networks or connections sitting there. And I think that's, um, yeah, that 65, 75-year-old male group is, is an area of real vulnerability at the moment. They, um, again, simplistically, that group probably coping less well than yeah, kind of than the um, yeah, kind of general elderly population. But there are some very, very resilient elderly people there that we've got a lot to learn from. Well, I guess the other thing I would observe um, was just the elderly and their insurance stuff. You know, I think for a lot of us, we deal with those sort of people down the end of a phone or a call centre, resolving issues. But for a lot of the elderly, I think those issues are really mm. hard. And I think that's a moment where we all absolutely need to be stepping up and working with our people who aren't as confident doing those sort of things. Because if they don't know how to manage their insurance, they're going to feel that you know they're about to lose their major asset or... Mm. Generally, their life is going to become much, much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anxiety yeah. issues with elderly people, Caroline? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just like all of us. But I, I think it can be, I mean, like Jeremy said, some people really resilient, mm. maybe feeling that they've been through a lot already. But other people, and I think it is the complications of the physical effects, um, tripping in their homes, things being not right, that can complicate things more and make people less willing to go out, they just stay at home yeah. and, and everything else then falls apart. So I think the whole thing about after every major aftershock, just going to see our neighbours and yeah. just those very, very simple words of how are you are yeah. so powerful. Mm -hmm. It's actually good for us to do too. You know, you feel better when you've done that. Mm -hmm. I feel yeah. better walking down the hill and asking someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's actually going out and helping mm -hmm. is often a, a really yeah. good way of dealing with our own anxiety, mm -hmm. isn't it? Reciprocity. Reciprocity, that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And that, that smile and a how are you is... Mm -hmm still one of the most important things. Mm. We, we, we've talked a bit about going off and getting help and you know I went to see my GP today and it wasn't free. Um, how is it for, for a lot of people? I mean it's very difficult times. Do you, I mean should people not be going to see the doctor because they haven't got the money? How, how does it work in this modern world? I think if you've got a doubt you go because the GPs I think have been prepped to, to know that it may not all be physical and they know there's going to be stuff sitting beneath the surface. So our encouragement is you, you go, and there can be financial support for you. Uh, the DHB's made a generous uh, office. The, the so if you've got genuine health issues, go and see your GP, and you should almost never be turned away. They, they want to go and do the right thing. And be open about your financial situation. Be, be, be open with the financial situation, and if people genuinely need um, support there, there will be the support Even uh, there for them. Even if they're not sure that yeah. if they've got a need, they can go. They may not know if it's genuine. Yeah. And we'd much prefer people to be making contact than thinking, actually, I can't afford to go, and then that um, you know, kind of rolling into a major issue further down the track. And go and see your GP rather than just turning up at the Accident and Emergency Department, which is no longer called the Accident and Emergency Department, it's called, just called the Emergency Department. Mm. Well, in, in terms of the first point of call, general practice, and, um, and again, 24 hours a day, you phone in the middle of the night, there'll be someone there that's, uh, that's going to answer the call. If you've got a yeah, kind of a, an urgent illness going into the uh, one of the three 24-hour uh, well after-hour uh, general yep. practice uh, services, and if you're really critically ill, and and um, then going to the emergency department with that, and uh, if we can keep that in balance, it does mean that everyone's going to be able to access health in the most appropriate way. That's really good, guys. Um, thank you very much for participating in this panel discussion. Um, if people do need further help. As we say, start with your GP or the 24-hour medical practice. But generally, if you want support, you can also just ring the Sarah helpline, which is 0800 ring Sarah, and they will also be able to direct you to the right places to get you support. Thank you. <laughs>